that with you, you'll notice that there is a sheet to follow, and you can keep message notes there. Uh, what I like to do is I'm going to ask Jeff in just a moment to show you a video clip of David Platt as he is giving an introduction to this message. It's a personal story. And it's a humorous story and one that I thought would truly convey uh, to you his heart on this, this, this matter. But before we go to that, let me just say something about this study overall. Uh, sometimes it's somewhat confusing to a church family. Why would you do this during preaching time and all that sort of thing? There are so many times you have heard sermons that have things mixed in them that are, in fact, concepts from experiencing God. But we don't preach experiencing God. Henry Blackaby searched the Word of God. He looked at his life and how Scripture had come true in God's direction and purpose in his life. And he wrote a very simple way for people to see and understand that, looking at the whole counsel of the Word of God. But we don't look to Henry Blackman for this work to be accomplished in our lives, do we? We looked at a book called The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Ward. And even though there were some concepts in that book that we found very much like what we saw in the church in the book of Acts, and we appreciated a great deal the concepts and the, some of the ideas that were there in that respect, that we worship, that we disciple, that we fellowship, that there is mission, and that there is ministry, were things that we had a great appreciation for. But we would not agree with Rick Warren on me and the things possibly that he's doing at this current time. So we don't pick an author and then think that everything that he writes after that one thing has to be just as good or sound as what they've written in the past. So this is not to say that we think David Platt is all that in a bag of chips. Uh, what we're saying is, is that at this particular time, he grasped onto an idea, one that we have wrestled with as Southern Baptists for quite some time. It is the idea or the concept. Can a person have Jesus as Savior and not have Jesus as Lord? And the answer to that question, as I understand Scripture, is no. If you come to Christ saying to Him, I want you to save my soul. I want you to take away my sin. I want you to make me fit for heaven. But I want you to stay out of my business. Is that a saving faith? Now, that doesn't mean that I'm always going to live as if Jesus is my Lord. Am I going to fail at times? But if I come to Him as He calls me, and I come to Him with the attitude of, yes, you can save me. No, I'm not going to be obedient. There's no salvation. We come... And we present ourselves to God fully and wholly as we can at that time. But we don't cut deals with God. Uh, you can save me if you'll let me keep this habit. If you'll let me stay in this lifestyle. If I can blame you for the fact that I am the way I am and I don't have to change. If, 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 no. And so... We're going to look at these ideas of Jesus saying, follow me, from the framework of the fact that when you are coming to Christ and His call to save you, you are coming to Him as Lord. You are saying to Him, I am your disciple. My life is no longer mine. It's yours. And I may fail in my flesh from time to time to live up to that. 
And I'm going to confess that sin, knowing that you're faithful and just to forgive me of that sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And yet I am not coming to you holding anything back. So we start at that point, not with David Platt, not with Henry Blackaby, not with Rick Warren, but with Jesus, the Christ. Jeff? You were to ask me that, one on one, just sum up what it means to be a disciple. I would probably say to be a disciple of Jesus is fundamentally to believe Jesus' word and to follow Jesus as Lord. And that really encompasses a lot, to believe Jesus' word. So not just to read it and kind of move on in your life, but to bank your life on what he has said. To believe it with all your heart to the point where you you obey it. You follow Him as Lord, as the one who is your teacher, your guide, your master, who is sovereign over every single detail of your life. And you submit to, to do whatever He says to do and go wherever He says to go. So how does this play out practically in our lives? Day by day, what does a disciple of Jesus do? What does a disciple of Jesus look like? And part of the purpose of this study is to help take you on a journey where you begin to ask some intentional questions for how you can believe Jesus' word, follow Jesus' word on a daily basis, starting with filling our mind with his word. So not just settling for intellectual belief. All kinds of people would say they believe in Jesus. Even demons say they believe Jesus is who he says he is. Big deal. What does it mean? To so fill your mind with this truth that it transforms everything about your life. To, to know Jesus is to believe Jesus. And when we believe Jesus, we proclaim Jesus. And this is where we really begin to see that being a disciple and making disciples goes hand in hand. And I hope that will be evident in the session as we think about what it means to trust Jesus with our mind. Three, three truths I want to show you here in this imagery of Christ as a vine and Christians as branches. So specifically for your life as a Christian, as a branch, first truth. As a disciple of Christ, you are united with Christ. And that's the heart behind this imagery of a vine and a branch. To use Jesus' words here, as a disciple, you remain in him and he remains in you. Just like he says, he remains in the Father and the Father remains in him. So this is astounding imagery. As a disciple of Jesus, Christ is in you. You're in Christ. Christ with you. You're with Christ. Every moment, every day, united with him. His life, his death, his resurrection, his reign. So when Jesus says in John 15, remain in me and I will remain in you. Abide in me and I'll abide in you. He's summing up, in a sense, the essence of the Christian life. As a disciple of Christ, you are united with Christ. I remember when I was preparing to get married to my precious wife, and during that year that we were engaged, which seemed like far too long, during that time, I was finishing up school, she's a year older than I, and she had graduated college, and so what that meant was I was living the college lifestyle. I was eating ramen noodles most every meal. I was just kind of scraping to get by. No cash flow coming in. She, on the other hand, had graduated school and she'd got a job teaching pre-Ks, four, five-year-olds. And so she wasn't eating ramen noodles. She wasn't scraping by. She had cash flow coming in. And so when we stood together, in front of our friends and family on that day when we got married. On that day, I got so many wonderful things, most importantly being a beautiful, godly wife. But you know what else I received on that day? Cash flow. <laughs> it was great. One moment, no cash flow. I do. And all of a sudden, I had cash flow. By one moment, I had nothing in my bank account. The next moment, I had everything that was in her bank account. Now, I didn't have to go work, I didn't have to go teach her four and five-year-olds. Simply, 
because of the fact that my life was united with hers, praise God, everything that was hers became mine. Ah, oh, Christian, in a much more glorious way, when you unite your life with Jesus Christ, at that moment, not based on anything you have done, will do, or are doing, simply by uniting your life with Him, praise God, everything that belongs to Him becomes yours. His life, His death, His resurrection, His reign, and all the resources that are at His disposal are yours. We need to be united with Him. So see how ridiculous it would be to reduce being a Christian simply to saying some words, praying a prayer, and then moving on with your life. No, when you become a disciple of Jesus, your life is united with Him. You've died with Him. Picture the cross is a picture of your life. You've been crucified with Christ, Paul says, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. It's not me, it's Christ in me. Me in Christ, Christ with me. Me with Christ. And that changes everything about us, which leads okay, to the yeah. truth. When you can... Right there. Thank you. All right, so you, uh, those of you who are following along on 36, you'll want to notice uh, that the first few blanks there were filled in. Uh, as disciples of Christ, you are united with Christ, uh, would be uh, in that blank. And then also, uh, and by the way, Kathy, you're not going to see this on here. The next one is, as a Christian, Christ is in you. The next one is, you are in Christ. The next one is, Christ is with you. And the next is, you are with Christ. Now, for many of us, we look at this relationship with God uh, as if it were like a dog and his master. And we're kind of following Jesus around. And Jesus said, sick of So we go over and we witness. And he said, bad dog. And we tuck our head down. And oh, I'm so sorry that I said. The reality of the situation is what he was just saying, what David was just saying, is that Christ is in us. And we are in Christ. This is not a, a situation where he is dealing with us on an abstract from an exterior way trying to push us into a situation you went to my house tonight you couldn't go to the front yard because Bob and Buddy don't trust the front yard yet those of you, you who know who Bob and Buddy are they're our dogs you see they run around in the backyard and they only run around so far there are these red collars that they're wearing. And they were rather proud of those collars at first. They would not had collars before. And then as they started to go places in the yard, I would tell them, stop. And they look at me funny, and then they keep going. And all of a sudden, their red collar went beep, beep, beep. And I said, stop. And they looked at me funny, and then they kept going. And their red collar went, shock! Static electricity. Now, that's how many of us see God. And that is not the kind of relationship that Christ in us is about. So as you, those of you who have the workbook, you see all the circles, the concentric circles that are there. You see the very first step, that central step, is Christ in you. Without Christ in you, are you born again? No. Can you change to be like Jesus if Christ is not in you? No. The Christian life is impossible. It's futile. It will not work unless you have the central thing, and that is Christ in you. Christ in you in me, the hope of glory. But as you look at those other circles, uh, we're going to put the other ones up there for you to see. The next one out is Jesus transforms our thoughts. Jesus transforms our desires. Jesus transforms our wills. Not uh, just our will, Henson, but all of our will. 
Jesus transforms our relationship. In all of these things, we look up there and we see them and we say, yeah, that's great. But what happens to someone who comes to faith in Christ and all of a sudden the Lord starts changing their relationship so that all of these people who were their friends no longer want to be their friends? They're looking around and they're saying, where am I going to have any friends? Who am I going to have that's interested in what I'm interested in? And then Jesus begins to transform their thoughts and their desires so that now they can fit in and enjoy and appreciate not only the things of God, but the people of God. And they may have willed to stay in that old world and that old way of being, but because Christ is in them and they are in Christ, now they can see their will changing to be conformed to the will of God. So you're following the sheet on 36 when you confess Jesus as Lord, which is how he is defining salvation. He changes everything in your life. When you confess Christ, you kneel before him and you say, you are my Lord and Savior. You have called me and I receive you. My life is no longer mine. It belongs to you. When you confess Jesus as Lord, He changes everything in your life. Now, if you would, look with me at John chapter 15, verses 5 through 8. Now, you know I give you the verses, but you know I like for you to have them in your Bible because, let me ask you, how many of you think if you need a Bible verse really bad, you're going to be able to come up to the church and find that verse on the wall sometime during school tomorrow? Is that going to happen? No. So you need to know where it is in your Bible. You may need to mark it in your Bible. You need to make sure that you can find these passages. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides, oh, what's that word? 